Two weeks ago, an extraordinary thing happened in, in Paris, and if you were paying attention to the news, you'd be familiar with it. The Seine rose after several days of extraordinary rainfall. The Seine rose to the point where, for the first time in decades, the staff of the Louvre and also um, of other museums uh, down the Seine started to contemplate and then began to move towards um, evacuating the relics, the, the most important cultural artefacts which are held in those museums. There's a metaphor there in a way, the sort of the rush to try and save something from the rising waters caused by climate change. The metaphor is one for what may well happen to us planet-wide over time. And in a sense, Paris became one focal point, I think, for an extraordinary concentration of emotional and also practical effort to try and save ourselves from an impending sense of doom. Of course, that particular flood stabilised. The relics, the artefacts were all saved. Things seemed to be fine for the time being. There were 72 hours in which to move them to high ground. The Musée d'Orsay across the way had 96 hours. All of these things gave us perhaps a false sense of stability. So a few comments about um, the, the crisis, the, the tipping point, the ecological tipping point, which we're currently enduring. We're now living in a world of extremes. When I started teaching about climate change some 15 years ago, the expectation was that the sort of things that we are beginning to see now would occur in decades' time, 2030, 2050, by the end of this century. There's been an acceleration of a whole range of different impacts and a whole range of different pressures which people couldn't conceive of occurring within their own lifetimes. For example, the rate of accumulation of carbon dioxide and <coughs> greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has in fact accelerated over the last 10 years, partly as a result of um, uh, the process of industrialisation in China, also as a result of the process of industrialisation in India, two of the most important developing countries in the world. In 2015, for the first time, atmospheric CO2 levels rose to and re remained above 400 parts per million, which is a symbolic level. 450 is an even more important level. But the symbolism associated with 400 parts per million is that it's the highest level that we've seen on this planet for at least 23 to 25 million years. It has consequences. At this level, global average temperatures, based on the long um, evidence, geological evidence, which is provided to us by core sampling in, in the Arctic, the Antarctic, and also <coughs> coral reefs, indicates that temperatures should rise to three to four degrees Celsius. We're likely to see, over time, sea levels rising to between five and 40 metres above present. Again, think of the metaphor of Paris. The consequences for humanity, for civilization as we know it, are profound. It is, it is likely that some 25% of human habitation, most of which is coastal, is going to be affected severely or absolutely as a result of these changes. Paris came up with what would probably be accepted by most as the only possible outcome if you're going to have an agreement. The Paris Agreement aims to keep global average warming to as close as possible to 1.5 degrees Celsius and well below 2 degrees Celsius. The reason why I say that this is extraordinarily ambitious <coughs> is because if you take into account the implications of greenhouse gases currently in the atmosphere, we are probably already heading for 1.8 degrees Celsius. So at the moment, the commitments are for 2025, or in some cases, 2030. But every five years from this point onwards, those targets have to be reviewed and ramped up. And this is where the agreement's greatest hope lies, in forcing countries to renegotiate outcomes to bring where we're going to land in terms of temperature down. At this point in time, the Paris Agreement guarantees us at least 2.7 to 3 degrees Celsius global average warming, which may not sound much, but it is utterly catastrophic. You know, if you pay attention to where we are at the moment at 1 or 1.2 degrees Celsius, you get a very good sense of what the trajectory might look like. The other thing about Paris, though, which was of critical importance, and it really speaks to this meeting and to our hopes and ambitions, is that for the first time I saw, a lot of people saw, industry groups, big industry groups, non-state actors, NGOs, including industry NGOs, sub-national governments like Victoria and Quebec and so on, coming together and actually arguing the case for decarbonisation. For the first time, industry, in fact, was saying, we know that this is the end of the age of carbon. It's over. It's gone. We are, divestment is now a reality. Very big companies were talking about how quickly they could divest and how quickly they could invest in renewables. And that narrative of transformation, that narrative of decarbonisation, 
is probably the most important immediate thing that came out of Paris. When I come to these sorts of international climate negotiations, I know the limitations that are at play there. I also see the degree of mobility, the fleet-footed, the agile responses that are occurring at the subnational level. And so, to be honest, meetings like these and work at the subnational level, I think, becomes more and more important in that context. Thanks very much for listening. I'm going to talk about uh, this thing, uh, the Homegrown Power Plan. Uh, it is uh, a 12-page summary, but a 134-page report that I co-authored with a very good friend of mine, a woman called Miriam Lyons. And it's a policy roadmap for how we get to 100% renewable energy. Australia, I think, in our energy system stands at a crossroads. And the crossroads and the choices that we have is not a choice between dirty energy and clean energy. It's a choice between a managed, quick and fair transition to a clean energy future or a messy, unfair, slow transition to that 100% renewables future. Because the thing is, is that renewables has won. And the more that we say that, the more the inev inevitability of renewables gets into the mindset of our politicians, of our industry, of our leaders, in, and of our communities. Because it, renewables has won the economic battle. Wind is now, now cheaper than new build coal. Solar is now cheaper than, roof, uh, than grid electricity. We have ageing coal-fired power stations here in Australia. The, the average age is 37 years. The useful life of a coal-fired power station is 40 years. So we're going to have to see some coal-fired power stations shut down in the next 5, 10, 15 years. So the question is, do we transition to 100% renewables in a way at a speed that climate science demands? And in a way that all Australians, no matter where they live, no matter how much they earn, all Australians can benefit. That's the challenge we have in front of us. Everybody has a role to play. Households, government, communities, councils, businesses. I said at the beginning that Darabin was one of the most innovative around climate justice. I say that because of the Darabin Solar Savers Project. It's a model uh, that while done overseas is the first of its type in Australia where they've used rates, council rates, to finance and fund solar on 300 pensioners' roofs. We need to get serious about energy accessibility and affordability because while middle Australia, it's working, class, working Australians um, in the second, middle and sort of third income quintiles are the ones who are driving this renewable energy revolution. The lowest income quintile are currently missing out. People who rent, people who uh, live in apartments, who have shaders roofs and people who simply can't afford it. We need to be addressing this. Community Power Agency, we've just done a, a one-year advocacy project around this. I'd love to tell you more about it, but I don't have time. Um, I'll finish with four things that you can do. You can join Yarra or Moreland Community Solar. You can get involved with the Smart Energy Communities campaign. You can advocate for renewables for all policies that I've been talking about just then. Um, you can share the Homegrown Power Plan uh, with your MP or pretty much anyone that you want to. Those are some links there. I want to finish by saying that social movements are the thing that have made this renewable energy transformation possible and social movements are the thing that are going to get us even close to a safe climate. And so if you're not already involved or don't already feel like you're part of a, a movement, please get involved. So my area of research is more on, I guess, the other side of climate change, if you like, which is sometimes called uh, adaptation uh, and is increasingly talked about under the umbrella of resilience. Now, it used to be that this was kind of the stuff that you didn't talk about, <laughs> that this was kind of um, a, a, a sign of defeat, that it was a taboo subject. 
And certainly I see uh, reason for why we would think that and there is certainly de danger in talking about adaptation and resilience in the absence of mitigation. So then the question was, well, what can I say about uh, adaptation and resilience in 20 minutes when this is a very uh, full uh, uh, university course that I teach and so <laughs> I've, uh, I've chosen uh, six of some of what I think are some of the main um, messages or strategies if you like but I'm very happy to talk about others as well later. Middle out approaches are emerging as a kind of way of thinking past this mental barrier that we have which seems to be uh, oh this is all about individual behaviour change or it's all about what government and the UN are going to do for us. One of the things that um, climate change really brings home for us is that a lot of things in the world are a lot closer to us than we expect. And uh, in geography, which I share with Peter, they talk about topological space, which is where space is not just about what's next to each other, but space is how things are experienced in relation to each other. And so community can be about feeling very, very close to others around the world because you're part of a network with them. Community is, yes, it's about a neighbourhood, it's about who lives in Darabin and who doesn't, but it's also about a felt community, it's about virtual communities. And arguably these forms of community are a lot more powerful. And it's these sorts of networks, the social movements that Nikki rightly mentioned, that I think have the greatest um, capacity to really make a difference when it comes to climate change, which is, after all, about the effects of something happening on one side of the world coming and affecting another part of the world. Acting on climate change in the absence of kind of considering how we live and the effects of what we're doing really doesn't make sense. It's an abstract theoretical concept. What we need to actually be doing is looking at how we live, looking at what we do, and working out what it is we're trying to achieve and building climate change into that, whether it's adaptation or mitigation. So the first thing is to actually, as part of adapting, that is learning to live with climate change, we have to, of course, address the issue uh, and address the source of that. So that's about reducing the degree of climate change. At the same time, we have to also try to reduce the actual generation of impacts. So climate change impacts don't shoot down from the sky like some kind of um, bolt of lightning, though, of course, as we saw in Tasmania, lightning does have a role to play. But mostly impacts occur when certain situations on the ground interact with certain climatic and non-climatic uh, effects. So there's a whole lot of cascading relations that are included. And so the same sort of climatic effect, let's say a, a flood, for example, has a very different effect in one location or another according to what it intersects with. There's a whole lot that we can do to actually reduce how impactful those situations are by actually working to improve things on the ground. So for example, take a meteorological drought, so an actual reduction in the precipitation that a certain area receives. Whether or not that actually counts as a drought, of course, is entirely dependent on water demand. And so you have very variable uh, precipitation across the globe, but that's not to say that those areas that typically or naturally get low precipitation consider themselves to be in drought. It's all to do with water demand and how adapted the water users in that situation, human or otherwise, are to that particular situation. So we have to really start shifting our thinking to try to actually reduce the impacts uh, according to what actually occurs through the uh, climate change effects. Overall, there's no easy answers, there's no easy, um, there's no kind of silver bullets, but there is a huge amount that we can do. And one of the um, kind of things about this is that we need to act uh, not only individually, not only uh, through governments, but we need to act collectively in a lot of creative ways. We have a whole lot of different collections that we can come together as, we can, the, the good old consumer, which uh, you know shouldn't be discounted, bulk buying of solar, etc. Shareholders or divestment is shown to be a really important thing. Citizens, of course, we're coming up to our kind of exercising our citizen muscles. Activism has never been more important. Power as professionals, that's kind of really where that middle out strategy uh, is really talking about. All of us can be actually huge climate change advocates in our workplaces and of course as communities such as this. I'll leave it there. Thank you.